Thomas Lovejoy. Um, it's a true honor to have you here today and um, really want to uh, express our appreciation for your life's work and how your influence on the, the debates that we've had over the years. And, and now at this time in the history, I guess you could have predicted where we're, we're at given the decisions that we have and haven't made over the years. Um, Dr. Lovejoy has served uh, or is, I think, currently president of the Amazon Biodiversity Center, a senior fellow at the United Nations Foundation. And for those lucky students uh, at George Mason, and we have an alumnus from George Mason here on, the, on our staff, Drew Tower. Uh, he is a professor uh, in environmental science and policy department and uh, was the lucky one of the lucky ones who got to take a class with Dr. Lovejoy. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and so with that, I'd like to uh, open up the the questioning um, and people are still filing in here. Uh, let me, I, I told uh, Dr. Lovejoy that I would ask a, a question to get things rolling while people were still filtering in and and people are filtering in to, to start this conversation. Um, we had begun speaking earlier, Dr. Lovejoy, about the role of the United Nations uh, and the Convention on Biodiversity in affecting change. Uh, it's, it's an institution that is a global institution, of course, and raises questions of like these, biodiversity, that affect the world population. I was wondering um, whether you felt um, both the convention and the institution uh, was going to be able to solve uh, this problem. And uh, what obviously you spoke uh, in your presentation on the impediments to solving the problem, but how do we organize ourselves? Um, what institutions can we use like the UN and um, touch on, as you have, uh, the, the economic uh, effects and influences on our success or failure in this regard. So, so let's go back to 1992 when the three big conventions came into existence, climate change, biodiversity, and uh, basically desertification, degraded lands. Uh, climate change was out of the box even before uh, it was signed, issued its first scientific report. Uh, the Biodiversity Convention only issued its first scientific report last year. Uh, so there were some issues in the design and how things were managed. Uh, but also I think one just really has to stop and realize that nothing is called an environmental problem unless it affects living systems. So everything we call an environmental problem, whether it's pesticides or whatever, end up affecting biodiversity, which makes it the hardest part of the environmental agenda to actually make super progress on. So, my, my current conclusion is that until we find a good way to integrate the importance of biodiversity into the way countries actually manage their economies, uh, we'll always be playing catch up. And so I'm a big advocate of this recent suggestion that all countries have national natural capital accounts where they keep track of their biological resources. Yeah, thank you. Um, question here on uh, how can we get people to care more about the environment and biodiversity? Are telling stories enough? What sort of action should we be taking? So telling stories are incredibly important. 
getting people to actually stop and experience nature can be very powerful. You know, and right now in this part of the Eastern US, we have this once every 17 years uh, arrival of, of the 17 year cicadas. So that is getting some attention. Uh, but you know, in a month it'll be over and people's attention will drift. And I think one of the more important things is to actually pursue this connection with economics that I referred to earlier, because all governments in the end have to pay attention to economics if they want to stay in power. Um, and so if we can get that to be part of the way people normally look at managing economies, we should do a lot better. And what's the motivation there? What, how do you think that, is there a tipping point in various economies for people to begin rethinking, elected officials to begin rethinking their economies? So, you know, one meaning of tipping point is sort of a socioeconomic behavioral uh, interpretation of the point. Uh, it would really be unfortunate if it has to be some real environmental disaster that gets people to finally wake up. Uh, so that's why I really favor these economic signals that can get to people before the destruction is just so obvious that it hits them in their face. Yeah. Um, there was a question about, um, you know, how we break up these monopolies, uh, seed companies, ag chemical monopolies, um, that are driving out a lot of biodiversity um, and endanger small genetic base of major crops threatening the food system. I mean, you know, I guess this is, you know, it's a difficult question to answer, but, uh, you know, if we had our druthers, um, would we be breaking up these companies as monopolies? Is that a factor? Do you see that when, you, when you're in the Amazon, do you feel that or see that? in the way decisions are being made? Well, in many senses, the issue is, is not the size of those monopolies, it's what they're actually doing. And so the societal uh, incentives uh, that those companies in the end have to pay attention to is can be as effective a way uh, as you know shutting them all down and starting over again um, so they've got to be part of the solution no question about it yeah and to that to that end um Pharmaceutical companies have benefited from what we found in nature. I think you touched on this a bit. Um, and they've, they've monetized that and drugs, uh, learning from nature and mechanisms in nature and so forth. Uh, do, you see, do you see that on the ground? Do you see they're getting involved to protect nature from that perspective that they understand the value and what we can learn from nature? So you don't see a major effort by those corporations. You do see some effort from time to time. Um, but basically the, the, the issue is that they borrow stuff from the realm of science, which is the way science actually is set up to work. Um, and then they turn that into profit and human benefit. Uh, and there's there's nothing that actually encourages 
them to invest in the protection of what I like to think of as the, the giant library for the life sciences, which is what biodiversity is. Yeah. And so sticking with the economic issues and, you know, we, we talk a lot in agriculture, especially among organic farmers about ecosystem services and the value that they bring that the, that nature actually brings to the farm, cycling nutrients, beneficial, so-called beneficial insects. Um, how do you think that plays in or, or is, is creating, um, a value, an economic value, putting an economic value on biodiversity, uh, helpful? And can we do that in, in, in dramatic terms or? So, you know, there, there's some people who are just simply hor horrified by that idea. They think it is the, the quintessence of being disrespectful to the natural world from which we come. But if in fact, as this medium to large primate species, you know, whose numbers are approaching 8 billion, uh, creating, by the way, an ideal uh, situation for a virus. Uh, as long as, as long as human society is largely driven by economics and that kind of counting, we're not going to get as far as we should get without including nature and in how we manage things. Now, you know, could we arrive at a time when an inborn respect for nature is basically there and a sufficiently large percentage of humanity that they will just automatically behave in a much more benign way. Uh, that would be wonderful. But I think the evidence is it takes, it's going to take a lot to get there. And we need to essentially co-op this creation that is a human creation. Economics is a human creation uh, and co-opt it so that it behaves in ways that basically support our ecological and biodiversity underpinnings. Yeah. So let's say, um, you know, in a perfect world, we were able to take all the information that you've provided society over all these years and just turn things around, stop, stop hurting the environment. You know, we, we, we do all the things that you recommend and we stop hurting the environment. How long would it take biodiversity to recover at that point? Do you think? So I'm not sure I could even give a reasonable answer to that, but I would say it would not be at sufficient scale and sufficiently rapid unless we were able to add positive incentives. Yeah. And you've, you've talked about the, um, uh, the amount of land area that needs to be conserved uh, in terms of uh, individual governments identifying land areas that need to be conserved. Um, some scientists have suggest conserving half of the earth uh, for nature. Um, do you have a, a number in, uh, in mind uh, in terms of what our conservation goals need to be in that regard? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the half earth idea. Um, it's sort of hard to see how one could get there from where we are right now. Uh, so I have a somewhat different way of expressing that, which is that we should move from 
a vision of nature where it survives in isolated patches called national parks or whatever, uh, to a world in which human aspiration is embedded in nature. So, you know, instead of just little tufts of green here and there, which are our national parks or whatever, uh, we have our human communities sort of poking up out of green landscapes. And that also involves putting connections back in landscapes so species can move and follow their required climatic conditions. And you know what is called riparian vegetation, the vegetation which naturally occurs along water courses and does a wonderful job of protecting soil from erosion and protecting water quality. Directors at WWF, we went up to New York and met with the president of Channel 13 and showed an old BBC film called uh, Something in the Forest. So, the forest in the clouds, I think it was, um, about the Monteverde cloud forest. Oh, and, yeah. And it, and it grew from there. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Costa Rica's done a pretty good job, right? I mean, they are national parks, but I don't know what percentage of the country that constitutes, but. Well, it's done a lot. No. And back in the 90s when uh, uh, Jose Maria Figueres was president, they passed a public, they passed a environmental services payment law and they fund it with the gasoline tax. And so if somebody wants to reforest their land, they can get the government subsidy to do it. And so that's made a huge difference. You know, when there's no more gasoline being used, they're gonna to have to figure out something else, but. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna ask you one last question along those lines. Do you think environmental tourism is a good thing? Does that, does that I mean, that's a way of generating income, but is it good for the environment to have tourism that way? So it's, it's like a lot of things, you know, some parts are good and, and some are not so good. And, uh, you know, the, the downside at the moment is the amount of fossil fuel it takes for those people to do their tourism. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately that, part of it will get fixed. And I think it's a wonderful way for people to get interested in nature and to show the local populace that they actually live with plants and animals that people are willing to come around the world to go see. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, while you can pick at it and try and make it better, I think it's a really important part of the, of the mix. Interesting. And on that note, again, thank you so much for taking all your time on this and uh, and all the great contributions you continue to make and have made. So. Well, and thank all of you for what you do. It all adds up. Yeah, appreciate it. Great. Take care. Hope to be in touch yeah. again soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.